Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're we'll going to be looking at Sven Vanderplank's Battletech Lore and History, Age of War, a complete 500 year history. Okay, uh, I, I didn't realize the 500 year part because the little thumbnail I saw only had an Age of War. I didn't, no, we're going to the entire 500 years of it. This is pre Star League, pre Hegemony, like, this is like everything that kind of happens before the houses are really the houses when they're still forming up, as far as I know. And maybe some of them already exist, but they were just really different. This is after the Terran Federation collapsed, which honestly, I still wish we had more about that. I just, I'm getting distracted. More importantly, we're getting into the real old lore here in the sense that it's been a long time since I think anyone touched us. And because it's really far back in the Biotech timeline. So I'm freaking excited, man, because there's going to be warships in this thing. Yeah, I'm excited for that. So you guys know the deal. There's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. And yeah, let's just jump right in and see where this goes. The origin of man's journey into space dates back a thousand years to the early 21st century. Two significant world events happened almost concurrently oh. that would have ramifications extending far into the future. Ooh. On the political side of things, the assassination of Soviet Premier Tikhonov in 2011 ushered in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay, one, Tikhonov. Oh, I recognize that name from later things. I think it was a planet. Two, wow, um, Battletech is showing its age that the old lore is the Soviet Union collapsed in 2011. Yeah, it's it's funny. Who'd have, who'd have thought the Soviet Union in the future would still be a thing? This is... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's funny because it's looping back around. It's going to be a really awkward video, isn't it? Like, anytime we get into future histories from the past, it's always weird. It's going to feel like that for a while here, isn't it? Yeah. I began a civil war that would consume the nation. Never that when one the war spilled over into West Germany, NATO forces moved into Russia to secure their nuclear arsenal, while the more Western-friendly liberal faction came out on top in the fighting. As opposed to what happened in reality, where that entire nuclear arsenal is now dispersed over... Places that definitely have control with it, and there's no arms dealing at all. <laughs> uh, it's fun if you don't think about it ever. Yeah, don't look it up. It's, it's really depressing. In the aftermath, the victorious powers unified to create the Western Alliance. A second wow. major war was never narrowly that averted when the Asian co-prosperity sphere attempted a naval blockade around Japan. The situation was successfully de-escalated after only a single violent clash. And soon the major Asian powers were accepted into the Western Alliance. See, now that's just completely unrealistic. Things were peaceful and there was only a single clash. That's just completely fantasy right there, man. I mean, giant robots, sure. People getting along after shooting at each other for a single time? That's just weird. Alliance as associate members. By 2086, the Western Alliance has established enough of a power base to declare itself the first world government. Rebranding is yeah, the Alliance. The UN. An equally significant oh. scientific achievement occurred wait, 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 wait. into the West established enough of a power base to declare itself the first world government. Rebranding is the Terran Alliance. Oh, okay, Terran Alliance. For some reason I thought he said something else. An equally huh. significant scientific so the alliance achievement really just occurred here. around the same time was a when a team though. of scientists led by doctors Kearney and Fuchida were able to create a working fusion reactor. Ooh. This technology was quickly shared among the Western Alliance. Oddly enough, this part pretty accurate. I mean, it's off by a decade-ish, but on the other hand, as of literally within, I think, this year? Fusion power, baby! It's real! I mean, we technically had before, but it's actually producing more energy than it's taking. It's not up to, you know, scale. You can't actually plug it into anything or have anything plugged into it, but it happened for a very short amount of time. But it, it, it's the thought that counts, also the fact that it happened. So, yeah, it's close enough. This part's nice, yeah. During their study, the two scientists made a shocking discovery. Oh? Under certain conditions involving extraordinary amounts of energy, the rules of Einsteinian physics did not behave as they should have. Theoretically, it could be possible for an object to pass the speed of light. Their announcement- Okay, that's not actually a suspension of Einsteinian physics. That's just physics as Einstein described it and physics on the ultra micro scale. I'm actually just pulling a blank on the term. Like the- scale the quarks and leptons are at don't always mesh so yeah also then there's strange interactions uh, 
and then just all the crazy shit how they just discovered black holes generate light yeah i haven't even looked into that one because it seems too crazy to believe but yeah that's going fast than light isn't impossible if you fuck around with physics it just takes as of currently estimated jupiter's mass on the other hand prior to that it was uh, most of a galaxy's math you know what i misspoke there but i'm going to leave that as it is because that's basically also the same so this is accurate and probably based on the fact that this research has been going on for well before Battletech's existence, so they probably knew a bit about it. Huh. It was met with such derision from the scientific community that their contributions to the fusion reactor development were ignored. And they're also, this is one of the fun things. In reality, they weren't ignored. They were completely and utterly treated as non-entities up until things started to look a little more promising here and there. And now it's the new hotness. So probably actually exactly what he's describing now academic career is ruined sadly neither would live to see the fruits of their pioneering efforts in the early 22nd century the advancement of fusion power was such that it was now possible to test their hypothesis this program dubbed the deimos project would culminate in 2108 with the departure of the tas pathfinder which is oh so this is what this was about from harebrained schemes introduction to battletech specifically the game's intro itself Project Deimos, Raymond Banshee? Banch? Eh, however you say his name. Successfully jumped from the Sol system to Tau Ceti. Humanity had taken its next giant leap. Dude. That is pretty cool. I love that animation. By 2116, the Terran Alliance had established the first extrasolar colony at New Earth in the Tau Ceti oh, system. Oh, I thought that was Mars when this I saw it. This began the period oh. we now know as the first exodus. The astronomical oh so tau city was literally the first additional planet huh oh yeah that would be mars that's so cool i didn't know that i'm gonna geek out a lot right now costs involved in jumpship production meant that they were exclusively the property of the terran alliance at first but gradually this was opened up to corporate and private interests and even religious ventures by 2140 humanity had colonized numerous worlds within a 35 light year radius the number of viable planets for settling came as a welcome surprise, though true garden wells remained rare. Wait, really? I thought there was an extensive program of basically building up planets because the further out you get into the periphery, the less habitable they are. That's weird. Like, do they just happen to randomly exist in a spot of the galaxy that everything is just more habitable? I mean, not garden planets, but habitable? Huh. That's actually weird. I wonder if they ever addressed that. In the late 22nd century, a series of grand surveys were undertaken to chart Ooh. humanity's expansion, with the final count in 2235 yeah. standing at over 600 worlds within a 120 light years of Earth. How there was, however, it? another purpose to the grand surveys. Nominally, all new colonies were under the control of a Terran Alliance appointed governor, but as humanity continued to expand, the Oh, yeah, they want to see just how big it is because, like, oh, shit, levels of, yeah, we're not taking care of this. Distances that involved makes sense. began to cause problems. With planets dozens of light years apart, no conventional means of sending messages was possible without literally years of delays. The colonists fell back on a courier system where the ships themselves would carry the messages and then beam them to the planets upon arrival in the target system. Huh. Oddly enough, courier system makes a lot of sense considering that's how, and this is a horrible example, Britain managed her colonies, basically sending boats with letters, which is basically what happened here. And considering how most governments in Battletech go, probably a very apt comparison. I'm not going to explain why right now, because I want this video not to get hit by anything. Yeah. This still had its issues. Though the jump ships traveled instantaneously, mm -hmm. they required weeks to Cultural recharge. Weeks. Coupled with a maximum range of only a couple dozen ones. light years, the more distant colonies found themselves increasingly removed from Terra. And as new generations grew up without even seeing the mother planet, they became somewhat resentful of Terran. Yeah, and honestly, unless they make a system where it integrates them as equal partners, which they never do, that's never going to go well because it's like, oh, we're basically second class. And yes, they actually are at that point. I'm still surprised that this led to the Federation, or not, why do I keep calling it the Federation? I'm thinking Star Trek, aren't I? Probably the Terran aspect just picking up root later on. I guess we're going to get a lot more happening before that. Rule. 
The Grand Surveys were themselves a warning to the colonies. That, that we no know you're there. how far you traveled, you were still within reach of the Terran Alliance. But this also backfires a lot because when someone mentions what time they left at and what time they finally got here, it's like, yeah, don't worry, we're going to get to you. Uh, how many decades has it been? Oh. Oh. Yeah, no. We'll eventually get to you in a couple years. Maybe. Probably not. Let's see what happens. Yeah, honestly, by the time someone gets a message back and then they come back with more reinforcements after gathering them, and I, I can see this falling apart pretty easily. This was a state of affairs that couldn't last, and in 2235, the first of the colonies declared their independence. Freedom. It would ah. take eight months for the word of their rebellion to reach Earth. Really? That close? Uh, sorry, Denobola. I'm assuming that's where it started. And eight months. That's actually a lot faster than I expected. Like, unironically faster. The Outer Reaches Rebellion, as the ensuing conflict would become known, did Ooh. not go the way either side anticipated. Everyone died? The superior technology and training of the Terran Alliance had made them confident of an easy victory. The rebels hoped that at the end of a long and bloody conflict, they would come out as the victors of a war of attrition. Oh, I see how this is going. Warship doctrine. We don't have to fight a war of attrition, we just have to say fuck you. What happened instead was a series of botched initial assaults that immediately really? revealed the Alliance to be nothing more than a paper tiger. The cost of mounting an invasion across such vast... They... I d Really? <sighs> it's literally the exact same problem the Star League went into. The techs went over. You know what? I'm seeing a pattern here of... Terra-aligned governments making stupid decisions when they think they don't have to worry about it. I'm sure that's completely innocent and like, not related at all. Yeah. Distances was astronomical, and growing political unrest erupted on Earth. When demands went out for already struggling loyal colonies to increase the amount of goods and personnel they were contributing Ooh, to the war, the number loyal. of secessionist planets increased rapidly. After little more than a year, the expansionist government was ousted from power and replaced by a liberal, Terran-focused government that wanted little to do with the distant colonies. In 2242, this new body issued the Demarcation Declaration. All colonies beyond the range of a single jump were now independent, whether they- Oh, that's how far I went? The single jump, I mean, they're not short, but that is- That does explain why they are so very small. Huh. Sorry, I just I find this absolutely just fascinating because it's the exact opposite of the later BattleTech era where they have jump capability if only as relics. So they have it but they're not going to touch it because they can't really reproduce at the moment until much later on. And then they have the HPG network which Star League makes sure is well maintained and they could probably reproduce it if they needed to, but probably wouldn't like to. Because they have it well maintained, even if it's probably uh, issues. But this is the exact opposite, where they don't have the communication, but they do have the jump. In the future, it's they have the communication, but not the jump. Wait, I just said that backwards. Well, you know what I mean. Basically, it, just, it would have changed so much if they had developed the technology to communicate before the technology to jump. That would have changed so much. They would have cut down the distance, made them feel much more homogenous because they could have interacted faster. Honestly... Or they could have probably just set up individual blocks that made them their own fiefdoms that were part of an overall government and integrated in, basically like the UN does. But there's no way that would ever happen because then they would have to cede power to do that. So, yeah. And the replacement is like, fuck it, we don't care. So, yeah. Ah, sorry, I just, I, I love these alternate ideas, like how this works and seeing how this is happening in the canon and just... Ah, oh, <laughs> this is just pure and utter geek sugar for me right now. You know, putting it that way sounds really bad. I should probably cut that out. Yeah, future me. Cut out that phrase that I'm sure will never come back to haunt me. Thanks. They had the means to provide for themselves or not. The fallout from this was catastrophic for the colonies. Few had reached a point of self-sufficiency, and the majority of the jump ships had been owned by the Terran Alliance. Where it was no longer possible to remain, what colonists could quickly moved off-world, and many planets were abandoned. Worse, some populations were left to die without sufficient quantities of fresh food and water. When word of these disasters got back to Earth, the Liberal government lost its majority. So began a cycle of revolving door politics that lasted for 70 years between the two major factions of the Terran Alliance. During this time... Wait, so knowledge of horrible consequences actually did something? 
Oh, this is definitely fantasy. New nations were springing up, but the alliance was solely focused inwards. Both sides moved to secure power, growing their paramilitary forces. Violent clashes became increasingly common, and this political unrest on Earth kicked off the second exodus. Freethinkers and scientists rushed to escape the oppressive, stagnant alliance, and join the fledgling powers now recolonizing space. Oh, oh see that's fascinating to me. Because I'm used to the idea of Terra and the hegemony being the center of all the really crazy amounts of thought and the repressive totalitarian aspects coming with a lot of the later stuff. And, you know, like they definitely weren't before that if you, you know, pretended not to notice. But the idea that all of the people who had the crazy ideas would go other places just is weird because where would they go? I'm assuming probably Steiner or what became Steiner because money. But also, I thought that was actually founded in Rochelag, 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 however you say it. I know, when I found that, I was like, oh, that's surprising. I'm kind of wondering where they went in mass. Or did it kind of just spread out everywhere and what became the houses picked them up? Or were these the people who started the houses? Ooh, that could be interesting. The spark that ignited the fire was the death of the leader to a new political body that both sides had been courting. Liberals and expansionists blamed each other, and open war followed. Is it called Rim War? chaos reigning on Earth and the conflict spreading to other planets within the Alliance, drastic action was needed. The Alliance Global... So you're just not gonna... Like, you mentioned that there was a leader that was killed, and literally quote what is essentially the start to Gundam Wing, and not give us the leader's name. Is it Hiro Yui? It's probably... I'm just gonna say this guy's name was Hiro Yui, who the faction everyone was trying to court. When he died, it started a planet fall, even like an Operation Meteor, you could say. He hasn't corrected me yet. I'm going to just say that's how it went. Militia, which had distinguished itself so poorly during the Outer Reaches Rebellion, remained neutral. Yeah. Over the last half a century, I thought the, the AGM had seen really major not. restructuring, the lessons having been learned from their prior embarrassment. Now, the global militia was a trained force to be reckoned with. The Alliance Navy, with Fleet Admiral James McKenna at its helm, now boasted a fleet of jump-capable warships that surpassed any other in existence. As in, they have warships, also... <laughs> warships are back sorry i just giant freaking spaceships man it's my thing and i love this the initial inaction on the part of the agm has seen smaller units break off to join one side or the other in the civil war oh? but mckenna was not prepared to see his military disintegrate attention all agm members currently participating in the barbarities oh you've got to be kidding me I know history repeats, but they literally repeated the clan invasion by two sides of Earth coming to fight each other. The Amara civil war by the two sides fighting over Earth and a civil war. And now it's even in the freaking pre-hegemony Terran section, right? I don't need... And it's literally the... Biotech history really does repeat itself in ways that I'm going to pretend are not accurate to reality. Wow. Cease all hostile actions and return to your barracks, or I will bombard you into oblivion. That would this do it. was the message McKenna's fleet beamed at Earth upon arriving in orbit. And already though, he has differentiated himself from Kerensky entirely. Kerensky wouldn't have done that. Also, he had mechs to go down there and stomp people in person. This guy is definitely doing the warship doctrine of fuck all y'all. He quickly followed this up with a show of force, using his fleet to demonstrate his global reach by erasing two islands, one in Scotland and the other Australia, from existence. A brief campaign to hunt down and arrest those political leaders who did not surrender brought the civil war to an end. Feeling a great shame for what had become of the once promising alliance, McKenna declared the old order abolished. So literally because of a civil war, he went in there and said, fuck all y'all, and then cooed it. Huh. Yeah, that would do it. I have warships is literally a good reason to do that. The great democratic experiment had failed, and in its place, something new was needed. In 2315, the autocratic Terran hegemony was founded, with Director General James McKenna at his head. McKenna was at the head. Huh. Always in 2242, when the Terran Alliance issued their demarcation declaration, the colonies found themselves in an untenable position. Only a tiny fraction had achieved self-sufficiency, the others relying on trade to get by, particularly imports of clean drinking water. Oddly enough, this entire situation is definitely inspired by, I think, the Foundation series, which was coming out in the 50s, or no, it was either the 60s or the 70s it was written. So they were definitely reading this because the entire thing about Foundation is 
the central government, which is very strong, is going to collapse because it's just too big and will fall in on itself. Yeah. Honestly, though, not a bad thing to base it on. In this hostile climate, herd instinct kicked in, and the various planets started to cluster together into micro-alliances, protonations, and trading leagues. It was a time yeah. of rapid change. <laughs> herd instinct having to wait until bad things happen. <laughs> oh, that's just optimistic. And forced evolution for the colonies. During the remaining 75 really? years of the Alliance, over two dozen new interstellar nations would arise. Among them, we can see the foundations of what would go on to form the five successor states in present day 3025. It would be a mistake, however, to think that the rebellion marked the first appearance of these new states. Oh? Certain of them existed even prior to this in a really? limited or unofficial capacity. The earliest of all was a historical anomaly, dating from the first exodus and existing beyond the borders of known space. The Muskegon Empire has the dubious distinction of starting the trend. Wait, what? In 2163, I'm going to have to read that. That what empire? The Muskegon Empire. I don't even remember that one. Apparently it's maybe absorbed into something else. The Muskegon Empire has the dubious distinction of starting the trend. In 2163, a jump ship bound for neighboring McHenry malfunctioned, stranding the colonists on uncharted Muskegon. Oh. This world was borderline inhospitable, and with no means to return or to contact the Alliance, the ship's crew took drastic action to ensure survival. Oh. Personal freedoms were suspended, and all available energy and manpower was poured into establishing a fragile existence. By 2177, repairs to the jump ship had been completed, but by this point a social hierarchy had developed between the original crew and the colonists on board. The former now lauded it over the rest, and had little desire to return to the Alliance and see their power surrendered. Instead, they traveled to nearby Emerson and Baton Katos, establishing new colonies using slave labor in the form of criminals and the colonist class citizens. Four more worlds would be added to the fledgling empire by 2190, and by the time their existence became well known, the Terran Alliance was on the decline, and the Muskegon Empire would become one of the dominant players in that region of space. Oh wow. Honestly, I thought it would be a joke about the... T not Tauri... Taurian? Not Turian. Yeah, that's a different one. But no, this is basically a pirate kingdom. Also, they just missed it by just a tiny bit, but hey, entire galactic units count. But this dictatorship was not typical of early expansion. Oh? The scarcity of jump ships in the early days caused many corporations and conglomerates to form trading alliances to better pool resources. One of the earliest of these was the Chesterton Trading League of 2193, really and close later to the Tamar Pact of 2235. Though initially these alliances had little interest in world governance, post-rebellion, many of the two dozen major trade... Wait, that's Tukai... Oh... Is that the beginning of Roslag? Roslag? How do you say it? ...groups would transition in this way. The Capellan Zone, as the region of space that birthed the Capellan Confederation was known, was the most turbulent and active during this early period. Really? Dozens of worlds were already forming alliances, and several planets would become key players in the conflicts that would arise over the next 200 years. Oh? Initially, these were one-world republics, such as the dictatorial Sarna Supremacy in 20... <laughs> Sarna started off. Sorry, just... Yeah, the repository of knowledge that everything from Battletech comes on. And it's a dictatorial supremacy to start with. Of course it is. 176, the Tikhonov Union in 77, Ooh. the Liao Republic in 89, and the Capellan Holdfast in 93. The Capellans and Sarans quickly came to blows when explorers from the supremacy stumbled upon the unknown colony and tried to claim ownership. The Terran Alliance was still strong enough to prevent any aggressive colonial actions within its oh, borders. Oh, that's early on then. So the Capellans were able to defend themselves against the now multi-world supremacy and re-entered the political scene in 2194 as the Capellan Republic. The Capellans would play a key part in the First Exodus, when in 2218 they established the Capellan Library on the planet Gypher, a massive repository of information freely available to neighboring worlds, which in turn drew many of Earth's greatest scientists into this region of space. Sensing future trouble with the supremacy, they formed the Capellan Co-Prosperity Sphere in 2220 to protect from the expansionist actions of the Sarns. Capellans as the beacon of knowledge and libraries and mutual defense against an aggressor. 
I mean, to be fair, that last one is pretty accurate because everyone wants to fuck with the Capellans, but also because the Capellans are assholes. But more importantly, it just it feels weird. I know there's actually a very high standard of literacy in Capellan lang or lands, but at the same time, it's also like you're literate, so you can do the basic slave labor. We're not going to call it slave labor. Granted, that's kind of like in everywhere is basically doing that in Battletech, just with much nicer titles in some places. Five years later, the attack came, but the Capellan militia were able to rebuff the invaders, and when reinforcements arrived from off-world, the supremacy forces withdrew. It is perhaps telling that all this was going on right under the noses of the Terran Alliance, without their knowledge, as just a decade later, the Outer Reaches Rebellion would ignite. So basically, that alliance wasn't so much being pulled back as they're acknowledging they had no control accurate because they weren't in control and there's other alliances being created and everything wow three case studies could be made of the planets from which future dynasties would spawn during this period Marek, liao and new avalon home to house davian wait 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 new avalon was already i actually don't know where new avalon is i think it's somewhere around this area during the Outer Reaches Rebellion, oh, Marek yeah. remained staunchly neutral until the 11th hour when they threw in their lot with the rebels, declaring their independence in 2238, one year after Terra had already withdrawn its forces. By 2241... They waited to declare independence until after the enemy was gone. It's like, yeah, don't worry guys, I'm here to help you after the game is over. See, I was a team player after the game was over. Uh, I see a trend. The Republic of Manic was fully formed, and now counted four worlds under their control. In New Avalon, their loyalty to the Alliance was- Oh, so it's really just to the galactic, I guess, upspin? East? Let's go with East. Of Muskegon. That must have been an early conflict then. Pushed past this breaking point when ever-increasing demands for crop yields created a situation where thousands risked starvation. In 2237, the Grain Rebellions would see the AGM Colonial Marines pushed off-world and a new democracy established. Oh! Lastly, and perhaps most ominously, the Terran Ambassador dispatched to treat with Victor Liao would find himself returning to Earth without the levies he had been sent for, and also without a head. Okay, that part I was expecting. The entire, oh yeah, he just came back empty-handed. Surprising, I thought they would kill him. And then they killed him! Okay, never mind, that makes sense. Like the New Avalonians, the Liao Republic geared up for the inevitable retribution, but it never came. The Alliance was done with space, and in 2242, that, yeah. formally withdrew its borders. Huh. An explosion of new interstellar players occurred during the mid-23rd century. Because everyone with the good tech and the good knowledge basis would suddenly be fleeing there, and Liao is probably going to be one of the recipients if they had the knowledge of the libraries, and that they're one of the bigger players at this point. That is still so weird to hear. It's like learning that there is a good curry, well, guy who is the, what do they call the person in charge of? You know, I literally just director it, director general. No, it's not different. The person running Kurita being honorable and not in the honor way, but the actually carrying it out and not being a dick way as in imitating the clans without realizing because that's definitely what they patterned the clans after. Yeah, it makes for an easy or antagonist. It just, it's so weird to hear how things are different here. The Good Federation guy, of Liao. Orient in 2241, Nanking Collective in 42, Tikhonov Grand Union in 43, which oh. incorporated the Chesterton Wells as a province, St. Ives Mercantile Association in 45, Dominion of Regulus in 47, and a Scion Supremacy in 2250. Oh, another supremacy. In more distant regions of space, the United Hindu Collective formed, as did the Rimworlds Republic in 2250. Wait, wait. The Rimworlds Republic already formed this early on? Oh wow, they're early. I knew about the Hindu Collective growing up, and they're definitely one of the people who start Davian, but... Huh. The, followed by so, the Torian Homeworlds in 53. Oh. By far the quickest off the mark, however, was the Republic of Marek. Really? Not content with a handful of worlds that had agreed to an alliance at the outset, Marek military forces began a campaign that would see them grow the realm to 20 planets in only 5 years. Wow. After the conquest of Atreus, the Republic rebranded as the Marek Commonwealth in 2246. This made them the preeminent power of the day. What House Marek was achieving through conquest, Not ever House seen Allison of Orient achieved through diplomacy, likely playing off fears of Marek Commonwealth expansionism. By 2271, they had grown to rival their neighbors. The relationship between the two burgeoning powers was cool, though not hostile. 
Meanwhile, New Avalon's shining attempt at democratic government had collapsed. Though this had been one of the planets better prepared for independence, there was still much that needed doing and their system of yearly elections was so slow and focused on the short term that the people were suffering. Nah, too easy. A bloody civil war soon erupted among the powerful estates that would see a new order ushered in and the gradual rise of House Davian. The new government was a swing to the opposite extreme, with officials serving for life, but in the aftermath of war, stability was what was desired most. It's worth noting that not all of the newly independent worlds saw the rise of these new states as a positive thing. Many believed that self-governance was the best way for any planet to function, and this held true throughout most of the inner sphere. This really? was certainly true for the Crucis Reach, where New Avalon was situated. Corward of Earth, trading clans such as the Tamar Pact, which would eventually transition into a government, Sky Freight and Goods, and the Yazawa Mercantile Association held sway, and this region wouldn't see interplanetary unification for half a century. In the more volatile Rimmer. Wait. I know that area of space. That's Kurita. That's the Draconis Combine. They started off as merchants? Who embraced not being militaristic assholes? Oh, this is weird. In regions, new collections of planets continued to form. The Stuart Confederacy, formed in 2259, <laughs> brought another dictatorship into the political Of sphere, course it is. And this was followed by the isolationist Rosalhag Concordium in 2260. So that's where Rosalhag is. Russell Honestly, it's significantly coreward than this one. Honestly, because the 2K, I thought it would be similar around here. I guess they haven't joined just yet. Others in the Capellan Zone were restructuring to form the Chisholm Protectorate in 65, the Cyan Commonwealth in 67, and more notably, the Capellan hegemony in 2270. Oh. By far the most significant development in inner sphere politics occurred the following year. By now, House Salage of Regulus had a trade realm to rival the Mariks and Allisons. Each counted among the most prosperous and most powerful nations in existence. But thanks to the efforts of statesman George Humphreys, war between the powers was never on the cards. After several years of intense negotiations, the three houses signed the Articles of Unification, better known as the Treaty of Marek, and unified to create a new superpower, the Free Worlds League. Though the so the first one to really come up was Liao. But then... Okay, yeah, Marek has always been kind of backstabby and tempestuous, so this is probably their final form, and they're just going to change, but it doesn't really change how they work. And that also explains the logo because it's the size, isn't it? Oh, jeez. Term wouldn't be in use for another 500 years. The first of the successor states had been born. Really? I thought you already mentioned Liao. Oh, okay, it's just called the Liao Zone, though. That's why. Okay, this is weird. It's like all the different things they do, but it's just... It doesn't feel normal. It feels like something's going on and it's like it's upside down. All the hallmarks of all the different groups are like, hey, remember how we do this thing? It's going to be different. It's going to be very different. It's going to be absolutely just not normal. Merrick is taking over and it's huge and they're doing it through a little military, but then a lot more through diplomacy. Liao is a representative group of self-defense and a freaking library? Looks like Kurita is starting off as a trade union. Uh, Ross will like being around and being isolationist is actually the most normal thing I'm thinking like right now. It's like, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. And even then, I know that's because there's other things that happen later and it goes back and forth. It's technically the beginning of Steiner and I, I just, this is... I, also, Davian falling in on its face. That, okay, sure. That, that's basically normal, except they don't have the resources to pull around to cover it up yet. Ah. Also, I haven't come back to that one pirate kingdom yet. And I just want to, what's going on? Sorry, just the more he talks, the more I'm like, I did not realize there was even this much information about the early years. And we're just getting started. Because next up, we got the rise of Curry to end. 
I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what their entire thing is going to be like. Are they actually not going to be the evil assholes that you just want to punch in the face because it's an easy morale boost? But yet they're also incredibly competent in fighting. I doubt that, but it, I, I could be wrong because we were here and it just feels weird. But I like this. This is fun. So if you haven't already, link below. Original video. Hit it up. Now you're done. Don't forget to leave a like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one because we're definitely doing more of this. Uh, see you then. Adios.